Would you please check your ideas and opinions at the door? All your philosophical and religious views, all your logic, because I say check it at the door advisedly because you can pick it up again when you go out if you feel unsafe without it. I'm not trying to argue you out of your opinions and views. I'm merely suggesting that for the sake of an experiment, you temporarily suspend it. Hello and welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, an exploration of all things philosophical, alchemical, and esoteric. From the psycho-spiritual to the material-chemical nature of the all. Join me and my guests as we inquire into the liminality of mind and matter, and tend to the fertile soils of awareness and perception, while facilitating an expanded consciousness from the individual to the collective. If you enjoy the show and find it of value, consider supporting and becoming a patron via the Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophicalminds. A small contribution makes a big difference and definitely makes it easier for me to continue the show. Although, I will always do my best to keep it flowing regardless. Thank you all. Let's get into it. All right. Tonight, I am joined with Ani Osaru. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Okay. So I've been listening to uh, some of your stuff lately and just have been really fascinated by the way you kind of break things down and you get into the physics and etymology going into some really interesting books that I had never been aware of. And a lot of really interesting things that I personally haven't come across. Uh, The the other day you were talking about, um, and just to give a shout out to Juan, because that's, I heard you on a cast with Juan and a couple other guys. That was a, that was a good one. Um, And yeah, like the other day you were talking about like, uh, the Gnostic physics of the rosary bead system and just really interesting stuff like that. You've got a lot of, you cover a lot of topics from really unique angles. So I'm really excited to get into this, but I guess before we do, do you want to maybe add anything about yourself uh, or your background for the listeners additionally? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, For those who don't know, who I am. My name is Ani Osaru. I am a metaphysician. I will call myself a spiritual counselor. And I uh, run the Spiritual Shade Room, which is a, a social media media network that showcases hyperlucidity. Hyperlucidity lucidity is what I call running with the masses of media and showing you showing people the esoteric background to all of the information that's being spit out day by day controlled by the Illuminati Jesuit brass. And I break down how is all the world stays. I'll call it, I'll call that hyper lucidity. So that's what spiritual shade room is for. I also am the, am the author of the blueprint of darkness that's on Amazon right now. And I wrote that book back in 2018 to help initiate people into spirituality. Overall, what I do, I cover occultism, metaphysics. Yes, I do get into Gnostic physics. I ultimately want to get into what exactly the soul is and its comparison throughout mythology, mythologies, mythoposis, uh, metaphoric allegories that's in biblical texts, occult texts, grim wars, all and above, and the deep, deep, dark stuff, what it means to the magical systems, the subconscious of the mind. Uh, union psychology, I pretty much get into it all. What people don't know about me is I'm actually initiated into the occult realm. That's why when I can get on a podcast with Juan and the boys, uh, t- uh, Tommy, Donut, and, and other people who are great decoders and researchers, some of the best on the internet when it comes to this occult realm, but I can add a little bit more layers because the people that I've dealt with and the things that I've done in the occult and metaphysics have gone a little bit above just decoding it. So I have a a, a ample amount of information. I've tapped into the Akasha and um, met up with a lot of things that will surprise a lot of people. And yeah, I'm I'm very, very glad to be here today. That last interview you you had on here, I forgot the gentleman's name, but the way he broke down Abraxas really got me excited for this, man. Oh yeah. You have some great interviews. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, initiated into any particular lineage or kind of a self-initiation, or maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Both. I am, I have been initiated into Yoruba by Mother Oshun, Dara Nefertiti L, who passed away two years ago. Um, my head is uh, Oshosi. So I'm initiated in that sect. I do know a lot about Palo, Palo Mayambe, some of the most darkest black magic there is on the, on the planet, which is a combination of Congo and Native American systems. And I'm also um, self-initiated into my own system called the Nayaga Patu system, which is a, which is a combination of all of above. Uh, chromomancy, color magic, color physics, quantum chromodynamics, because spirits interact with colors in the mind. A lot of people don't know that. And I've created that system and we've really sustained that system. We built a language around it. So all of that and above, and I just love occult metaphysical information, esoteric information. I'm, I'm for it all, bro. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And a lot of stuff that you had just mentioned, I'm just so unfamiliar with, so I can't wait to explore <laughs> it. <laughs> um, it's fine. We'll get you caught up, bro. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there was like something you were mentioning on that particular podcast I was listening to with Juan and what was it? Donut. And then like Mario is Mario. I think that was Mario, one of the guys. Mario symbolic that. teachings. Yeah. And yeah. you're talking about like a quantum dot in your head that yes. entities can come through and then something around like 6 a.m. Or yeah, maybe just kind of like riff on that for a minute because that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we were talking about this just to put context to the situation. Um, there's something called the Nike Thamaron that people can research. And what the Nike Thamaron is, when you're studying astrology, and you're studying a very rare Arabic rim war called the Picatrix, that's the English transliteration. The actual name of the book is called the Hayat al-Hakim, which is the uh, uh, ast astrology book of astromagic that Arabic magicians and um, different sorcerers would use. Actually, the Necronomicon is based upon that book. A lot of people don't know that. And pretty much what I was talking about with the quantum dot, which is called the Bindu seed in the Vedic text, is a seed, it's called the spiritual sun in all of the mythologies. They call it the black sun. I think the Thule, the whole Nazi Reich, you got it from the Theosophical Society of H.P. Blavatsky and Hitler's teacher, uh, Rudolf Steiner and some other people they called it the black sun it's called many names in egypt it was called amin ra the hidden sun amin ra uh but pretty much inside of each of us we have this small quantum point on the kabbalah is called Daf. and this point matter of fact we have one here and one in between the genitals it's a spiritual sun and it's a spiritual moon I just learned it was a spiritual moon, half of it, about five months ago. It blew my mind. But there's literature behind it. And that makes sense. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. So what happens is these two points, the night Thamaron is tracking every part or organ of the body. There's important organs throughout the body, right? Every organ from your head to your feet aligns with the astrological sign. For instance, Aries it aligns with the both hemispheres of the brain because the horns of the ram represents the left and right hemisphere. And also the ram uh, in the Bible, Ab Abraham is transliteration of Ra and Abe and his wife was called Sarah. Sarah is talking about the left and right hemisphere of the brain. It was actually metaphysical and esoteric to the sign of Aries. So that's why he's the father of all nations. It's astrological, but it's also talking about the organ in your body that the spiritual sun starts at at 6 a.m. That's why 6 a.m. is one of the most important periods of meditation in yoga, hatha yoga, in uh, Sashumana 
yoga this kundalini kundalini this so shumna is the kundalini fort that comes up the middle of the spine straight into the pineal gland so that's where a centripetal force rises up and this sun it travels along along the sashumna uh throughout meditation so 6 a.m that sun is in each and our each and every one of our bodies in the middle of your head so that's the most important time of the day because the night thamaron is going to tell you by the time it gets to 4 p.m your spiritual sun may be in your thigh mm -hmm. at that point so it tells you where this thing is moving at and just like the sun in the sky is moving one unit per hour is moving also in the same rate astrologically so the stars in the gates of astro etherical um portals of or openings they're somewhat comparative in this movement of how spirits can come in and out and how our emotions change throughout the day and some of us depending on how our auric field has come in contact with certain things can be completely switched off course from what the regular frequency vibration that we were set to at a certain time period of us conditioning the way our auric field is it can be it can be completely thrown off and that's based on the people you come in contact with sexual interaction with certain people and who you uh what you spend your time conducting your mind and your thoughts around can really change the auric field and the geometrical pattern that the rising of these energies come in and out and and changes and scopes who we are as people so that quantum dot is traveling right now as we're speaking and the whole point of life when they show on the kundalini the caduceus the serpent chasing the apple and it bites the apple they're actually talking about the apple is the dot you're we're supposed to be chasing this thing for a lifetime and whoever can grasp it becomes an immortal they live on in other worlds because we have quantum bodies across the multiverse sometimes i don't know if this ever happens to you you may dream something and the dream can be so real to you but what happened in the dream never happened to you before but you saw the place in the dream and you had interaction with certain things in the dream you identify certain objects in a dream that's in the real world right now or the world the illusion that you you think is real around you right now that's because we have several conscious threads connected in the center i wish i could show a graphic but it's connected and there's there's uh different versions of ourselves experiencing consciousness and you might have a dream you might dream about what's actually happening in one of your quantum bodies on the other side of the multiverse and they may be dreaming about you on the other side of the multiverse and that's what the quantum dot is for is to open that port in that Man, connection that's trippy okay and you said that this travels along uh the Sa sashuma what what exactly is yeah, the sashuma sashuma mm -hmm. yeah the, the sashuma is a compartmentalized appendage appendage of the soul that yogists that do breathing techniques is right in the area of your chest on down into your diaphragm down here into your stomach and it it's like right above your genitals and it's what carries the centripetal force up so it can get into the pineal region and it can expand and when it's once it expands it's called samadhi it absolves all of your karma and then you start all over again and then you you expand it again it's like you're you're trying to get this thing so out there until you fit your whole entire uh existence back into the monad so the more and more times you do it you get back into the body of god the more and more times we do it so they don't that's why they don't they have you working so much in america and these other places because you don't got time to meditate you don't got time to get back and have samadhi absolve all things wow and so in terms of things like you were mentioning about our auric fields being thrown off by 
various different things or interactions through day through our day to day, um, multiple different things, probably like different uh, frequencies, maybe in the air. Uh, what are some of the ways that you've found most effective in terms of maybe like recalibrating and getting our our fields back in alignment? I would assume maybe a uh, maybe like meditation would probably be one that you'd mentioned, but yeah, maybe expand on that a little bit. Uh, different forms of meditation. One is a particular. Uh, meditation called the seek meditation s-i-k-h you can look into this this term of what the seek is and this a seek was a a a culture of people who only had a esoteric lifestyle of consciousness they live by a lifestyle of esotericism and metaphysics and the whole purpose of this meditation of the seekest is to bring the imagination back inside of the consciousness and to bring all of your um senses uh senses in the, the in the imagination so the imaginations can, can work work fully through your consciousness let me give you an example you can visualize in your mind during meditation an apple use your five senses you can taste the apple you can hear the apple once it crunch. You can imagine you crunching on the apple, biting into it. You can imagine the smell of the apple. You can, of course, you're seeing the apple and I miss one, whatever the last sense is. What this does when you do this over and over and over, you build your imagination and you strengthen it. You're strengthening meditating and visualizing this in your mind and what that begins to do it gives you the, the ability of a greek term called aletheism some people pronounce it uh, pronounce it aletheism but i you know i study pronunciation it's called aletheism and what what is aletheism aletheism is how to build a mental temple in the mind, how to build realities while you're functioning, me and you right here, and how you can be talking right now and I can leave, I could be listening to you, but I can leave and be in a whole other mental imaginative kingdom that I built up over years. I'm building the landscape. Now I prototypically teach in my classes that you don't wanna build another physical reality. That would be very stupid to me for you to put yourself back into a box. You want to create and be very imaginative and create landscapes where you're able to travel here and fro without a physical body. Because ultimately, we have to understand that we aren't humans. Humans is what we fail to when you study the Gnostic texts. We never were humans. Humans is an experience. It's a, it's a convolution of a, of a lot of things, but it's overall, it's a contraction of a period of time where consciousness had to go to lower degrees so it can become something higher on the back end. So those are techniques that I would establish building up your imagination through the seek meditation that actually studying what Aletheism is, reality building. And that's what I teach on my Patreon, on my YouTube, and that's like the gist of what I'm here to do to show people how to build this thing up amongst other things. Wow. Yeah. I think I had heard you mention something along those lines where you were talking about, uh, like one of the points was the fact that our consciousness was never human in the first place. And it's, you know, just our current inhabitation, basically that you said something about the, like the physical human form as uh like a refinement of uh, of our radiance or something along these lines uh if i recall mm -hmm. from that conversation like in terms of how it's dropping back into this lower uh human incarnation but it's overall a process of refinement or something along those lines does that ring any bells yes it's a refinement it's refining the radiance of something called the ray lines of the soul there's a book you can get by William Mead called 
Soul, The Path of the Destiny, something like that by William Mead. Probably have it somewhere in here. I don't know if you, I'm, I'm a big book literature type guy. I like pulling books out of the air and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the guy, his definitely, his name is William Mead. And in the book, he's going to tell you that the soul glances three ways. It glances during meditation, the, the soul glance, glances upward, downwards, and onwards. Upward, downwards, and onwards. And the secret is, is that over a lifetime in human existence, the mystery is when they show the alien, the UFO, that comes over to human and it sends down the tractor beam to bring you up into the ship. That's esoteric. See, one thing I'm very big on, I'm not really into the alien cults and um, reptilian stuff. So people get mad at me <laughs> because I break it down like, so I'm like, okay, y'all really believe that stuff. I'm pretty sure the government has reverse engineered a lot of things. And I'm pretty sure they're putting no alien shoots and alien suits and anal probing people. It was in the movie uh, uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Or what is it? Diamonds in the Sky? Fire in the Fire Sky. In the sky. That's another topic. Tractor beam. In the Kabbalah, the head of consciousness during the human existence is called the Yakita. Or it's called Yakata. Hebraic word. And the Yakada is a part of the soul that never comes down into matter. It is your UFO. So wherever you're going, it's like this, this UFO is following you like above. You know, it's in another realm, but it's up there. And wherever you're going, it's, it's follow, it follows you. Some people are able to see it. Now, would this correspond with the idea of someone's uh, da daemon? Or uh, like mm -hmm. the what they refer to as HGA, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Holy cool. guardian angel. And so when you talk about this idea of going back to what you're talking about, this uh, Bindu seed and the aim of grasping this seed, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Is it like a conscious awareness sort of grasping, or yeah, maybe just explain a little bit about. Well, once this the the um the centripetal force reaches phase conjugation when it absolves itself. A big, big study you can get into is Dan Winters. He's one of my teachers. Oh, yeah. I've done videos with him. Yeah, I've done videos with him. Um, what he teaches us is the phase conjugation of the Kundalini energy, and, and it creates something called astral hygiene. Mm. So just as you clean your body, you got to clean your aura. And the more this energy absolves itself and it goes into sam samadhi, when it goes into sa samadhi, that is the serpent biting the apple in the mythology. So that creates a viscosity of flow back into the monad. The monadic body is called the scintillas. So you're dealing with quantum, um, the quantum anatomy of your, your 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 consciousness and your your being your your uh ontology is your being and the more you absolve yourself to send that kundalini in meditation and you reach that level each level is going to be different than it was before it's kind of like a video game the harder the, the boss gets harder so how easy it may be for you to, to reach samadhi in your first time is going to be harder the next time it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be more waves at sea until you can cross the threshold. It's what the, the Masons call it, um, the, the uh, facing the chambers of reflection, you know? And the more and more you get to this area by doing these spiritual exercises, not only that, you have to live out the roles of the deities, literally. You have to start to condition your mind. And this is for the advanced people. This is what the Illuminati people are doing. <laughs> they're literally, they're not reading about Hercules or Heru, Horus and these guys. They're living out the mythology day by day because they study it so much. They get a different education than us that they're, the, the whole thing is a meta psychosis into the soul and it's physics in unlocking, threading to the soul to prepare you to transcend physical existence 
Even Manly P. Hall talked about it. He talks about it a lot. He's one of my favorite Masons because he gave me the keys to a lot of things that probably some wouldn't. So we're absolving that energy more and more, getting it up into the pineal, and it gets harder every time. But each time we reach that process, and you can feel the burning of the kundalini. A lot of people don't know, like, there is a sensation. It's called asthesis. That's the occult term. Um, you ever heard of stigmatas? No, I haven't. It's okay, like, when Jesus was crucified, some people can say during um, possession, they can get the... Um, the stakes that were nailed into his hand, they can feel it in their hands. Mm. Called Stigmata. There's a movie called Stigmata. He showed it in it. I've witnessed several situations in Kundalini exercises where I could feel certain um, feelings in my body that I, I can't describe to you. I actually wrote it because I think everybody should have a dream, well, journey, dream journal. Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. A dream journal or a grimoire. You should record these spiritual experiences. This is what the occultists, the metaphysians, is what they do because it's important to record it. Some people are like, oh, I don't need to record it and stuff like that. I'm like, dude, uh, Jehudi Thoth carries a tablet around. <laughs> You think you don't need to write down something like a, this is a one of, this is the God of knowledge and magic from yeah. Atlantis. <laughs> and we, when, we, we, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, when you're describing the feelings of these sensations, are they generally positive? Are they negative or both or? Well, it, see me, <laughs> I've reached a neutral state where my consciousness doesn't know negative or positive it only mm -hmm. knows experience so i literally had an experience where my body okay so i took a a psychedelic and i started meditating and my whole like my hands my 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 legs and my chest i started to feel this asthesis the stigmata it felt like something, an entity was coming in those areas. And literally I could hear inside of my mind, psychoacoustics of areas of my body. It was, it was like mouths was on my hand. I might scare some people, but they're, they're speaking to me. It's speaking. And I, I don't mean to scare people because they're doing like, Oh, this dude was tapping into demons or something like that. I don't, that stuff is really, that's for, um, that's for children. They, the, the, most of the world is that they, they, they've conditioned us. Most adults are children because most adults believe, and I'm not trying to badger anybody, but most adults really believe that there is a horned red man on the ground with a pitchfork collecting souls. They really believe that. And I'm not coming against your faith. If you believe that, it's completely up to you. What I'm just saying, if you want to get into the advanced physics of it, it's much more bigger than demons and angels. Much, much more bigger. So, um, I came in contact after a while, these voices converge into one. I came in contact with a literal Lemurian, a woman that I described. She told me her name was Nima. And I instantly went to the internet and I'm typing in, what is Nima? And I figured out that Kenneth Grant connected with this lodge back in like the 1950s called the Aeon Mayat Lodge. And there's a woman there called Nima. Anata Hara, which she was initiated through the OTO. And she says she made contact with Nima. So I made contact with the entity from Lemuria that magical lodges around the world was aware of the egregore and they recorded it in their egregores. Very advanced stuff. Wow. And Nima is the word amen backwards. Wow, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it's, 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 go ahead yeah well i was just gonna say there's so many areas we could take this um i go kind of going back to the because you mentioned the dan winter and the term phase conjugation and i've heard him talk about this a little bit i think he kind of describes it like in a geometric expression as 
uh, pine cones kissing noses where it's like an implosion of a wave function or something along those lines, if I recall. Uh, is that is that how you would go about describing it, or or do you have a, a, a different uh, yeah. way? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds correct. That yeah, sounds correct. That, that's he's so interesting to wave implosion. Mm -hmm. yeah. He is. He has a, a very neat vocabulary. Yeah. And what I do, I do give you the 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 um the big words, but what I try to do on my Patreon, I try to give you multiple understanding of what he's talking about or what it's about in general while giving you, because people think smart people use big words, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. Big words or literature in itself, like reading a book in itself is psychic energy. I got two books in one, right? But it's, it's psychic energy to the mind. So the more you're reading, these big words aren't just words because every word, these lines are geometrical, how you connect these lines to make languages. It's building the capacity for the intake of, of psychic uh, energies, mm. you know? So you're expanding your psychic energy where you can tap into words that people don't really speak like day by day. And even start to create your own words. We have classes on that, on how to create words to explain metaphysical experiences. Wow. And okay, so getting back into souls a little bit is a fascinating okay. subject for me as well. And I think I heard you mention, is it your understanding, like in terms of a fetus gaining its soul? I think you said uh, 46 weeks. Is that the particular... Uh, mm -hmm time frame when a fetus actually receives the soul in your understanding yes uh that's in a book uh called the daemon by um very uh anthony peak anthony peak wrote that anthony peak wrote the book the daemon okay he's been on a lot of podcasts i'll have to check him and, out uh, yeah check him out look him up on uh leak project Mm, okay. He was on Leak Project when he said that. So, um, yeah, so I, I confirmed that, that a lot of uh, different doctors and different occultists, people who look into this type of stuff, uh, spiritists, they believe at a certain time the fetus has to gain the soul, and they believe at the 46th week, and there's something with gematria, with the number 46, actually chaos equals 46 in gematria. Joe Biden is the 46th president. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that play with these numbers for the reason why it is the case. But I do believe that the, the soul is seven grams. There's a movie called Seven Grams where they weighed the soul. And it's because you actually have seven different souls. Only 90% uh, of people only get two of them. No, three of them. 90% 90, 90 of people only get three souls throughout a lifetime. The first soul you acquire, you know, when you become a fetus and you come into the world. The second soul develops around puberty time, around eight through 14, when males get the ability to produce male fluid, so to speak. I want to be very PG. <laughs> and females, uh, you know, they have their menstrual cycle for the first time, what happens here, you have gained the ability to make another soul. So you've acquired another soul, that's soul number two. Mm -hmm. And then when you become an adult, you acquire your third soul and it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's a soul of intelligence. Because if you, if you take a 23 year old and put them next to an eight year old and have a mental duel, the 23 year old is going to win 98% of the time because his experiences and him acquiring that other soul, he could easily trick this eight year old into things, you know, very, very simply just because of acquiring this thing. Most people stay right there. Four through seven is real trippy. I couldn't even get into that, but we're talking monadic consciousness. We're talking six sense type things, being able telepathic abilities um hyperdimensional travel of the mind is another soul 
So we, we're speaking, we're going all out into the woo-woo stuff that people call, you know, they call it, oh man, that's real woo. Hmm. So um, four through seven, I would say only the priestly class, they call the Kohayim in the Judaic, uh, even in the Talmud, they call it the Kohayim. It's a group of people who are born to be the priests and priestesses over humanity. I've they are of, the only ones that apply those. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. heard of the word like Kohen or like Alhu Kohen. Is that mm -hmm. the same word or is that different? Same thing. Same thing. It's, it's, it's called the Kohayim. That's the complete term. Short term Kohan, Kohen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the, the really interesting books that I hear you reference a lot is called The Celestial Ship of the North. Uh, yes. Talk to me a little bit about this book and what it contains. The book was written by a woman named Emma Valencia Strayton. And what she did, she studied under the number one Egyptologist ever because most footnotes in other Egyptology books comes from him. And his name is Gerald Massey, who wrote a lot of books. I think he wrote seven of them. The biggest being Ancient Egypt, Light of the World. So what she does, she's a student of him. She composes all seven, seven of his books into one, but she makes it into a esoteric astrology book. And in this book, she makes some clarifications of certain beings like Typhon or Drake, Draco, which becomes a part of the reptilian myth that who I call the cultists of Edom, these people who've grifted for years off the Anunnaki in the reptilians made millions of dollars off this thing. In, in actuality, this book, Celestial Ship of the North, is detailing a certain pole region in the sky that has control of consciousness. And she's detailing a period of a group of people called the Typhonians, who are probably the elders of the human race when it comes to knowledge. They actually taught the Egyptians. They come before the Egyptians, they're right after, because we don't have a lot of history on the Atlanteans and Lemurians. It's, it's more like some type of predictive type stuff with that. Mm. But we do have a lot of stuff on the Typhonians. Yeah, I've heard you say uh, something about the Typhonian dictation of fluxes and time currents and energetic valves. I'm hoping maybe yeah. we could break that down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these Typhonians are the hominids of the Androgyne. So prior to when we first get down here as humans, there is a hominid that's more androgynous than it is like me, me and yourself, males, because the secret behind males is we are degenerative versions of females. <laughs> And then, you know, people get mad you say that, but what is your nipples for? Why do you have nipples? Good question. <laughs> for, uh, what do you call it? Titty twisters? <laughs> <laughs> nipple, I mean, I mean, nipple twisters, I'm sorry. But, um, yeah, so the reason is, 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 is a deger degenerative breast. We are degenerative in how we got here. These androgyne, these Typhonian women, from what it says in the Parthenogenesis, and I'm not talking out my, you know, my head. You can look up the scholarship. It's called the Parthenogenesis. If you want to look into what I'm saying, they spoke about women who could lay their yonis towards the sun, and because their bodies were more androgynous, that means it had a a, a anatomy uh, more advanced than women today but they, they they look more like you know stud women uh more manly but uh they were still women and what they had the ability to do was channel the energy through the sun through their yanni you know i'm sure you understand what that is yes and <laughs> uh <laughs> they had sperm in their bartholin ducts so they didn't need a man to produce a child. So they would face their yonis towards the sun and the sun would give them the first sons, the first males. That's why we're called a son because the first females, the father of these first male hominids was the literal sun in the sky. 
So now we are called sons from now on. Now we are getting into Nephilim, Sam Yaza, uh, fallen angel talk when we speak about that. So what I'm telling you is just like the, um, the Cathars, a group of Gnostics that were burned at a stake for believing that humans are the fallen angels. I've subscribed to the same thing. I'm not into that the Illuminati billionaire classes, the cryptocratic, the aristocratic, uh, the, the plutocratic families are the, um, the fallen angels, the Nephilim. I don't ever subscribe to that, even though I do have uh, other uh, people in the other peers who believe that. But I would tell you straight up, the story is more vaster. I believe that all humans have a certain percentage of this Nephilim DM DNA. And we come from these hominids and the Typhonians, they, they're the ones that we have closest in record in history to have done this. And um, Typhon in itself is the polar region in the sky where Polaris is, which is a star that does not move. It's the closest star that we have to a uh, Nakshatra, a star uh, so far away it looks like it doesn't move, but it does move. Indeed, it's just too far for the human eye. It's, it's too far for the human eye to see it move. Um, these type of stars are very rare and they influence the subconscious of the whole planet. And Typhon or Draco was the constellation of pole region in the sky that the Typhonians realized made a shift. And the shift they didn't know created another hominid that will that will be birthed into existence because what happened i'll explain it to you when we first came down here there were three types of ways for you to interact with sex sexual activity you had procreational sex making a child you had recreational sex that's just you know you know doing your thing and <laughs> you had meta sex which a lot of people don't know about and what that is these ancient typhonians taught the egyptians that when you partake in sex you're supposed to imagine the chakras lighting up in your body male and female at the same time and when you procreate you really pull the consciousness from the monad, from the God regions in the skies, and you make a God as a human when you birth a child. What happened is we just started doing recreational more. <laughs> and when the pole shift happened, a disaster happened. And what happened is the archons started to pollute the clan data of genetics of those earlier humans so they started to take on bodies and this what birthed the late Egyptian dynasties who started worshiping the sun. And this was the birth of modern Freemasonry is when another soul group took over and possess the primary consciousness on the planet and turn it into religion away from the Typhonian uh, cults of spirituality. And this is when the sun became God. And they're called the, uh, the Ammonites. The Ammonite cults came after the 13th dynasty of Akhenaten, who looks like. If anyone out there is interested in purchasing any elixirs, spagyrics, alchemical formulations of any kind, do go and check out medicinebuddhalabs.com. And stay tuned because Taylor's actually in the midst of producing a liquid supplement containing a spagyric tincture of ashwagandha and shilajit. The shilajit's lab-tested Siberian shilajit. It's going to be roughly 25 grams per bottle, and it'll be sold at basically 15 to 20% under what the market is currently charging for shilajit. So definitely stay tuned for that. And... As always, enter PM Podcast at checkout for 10% off. Also, 
potable gold, iron potable. If you're looking for a solid source, Benjamin Terrell, the Temple of Mercury is the man. He's my personal go-to and I can attest to the quality. The Temple of Mercury.com. Philocast at checkout for 15% off. Additionally, if you want an extensive variety of alchemical offerings, check out ukeotiques.com. E-A-U-X-C-H-A-O-T-I-Q-U-E-S.com. Go on there, check out the shop. There's tinctures, elixirs, essences, mushroom blends and extracts, crystal and mineral metallics, ends tinctures, resins, all kinds of goodness. So uh, do go check that out. If there's something you like, uh, Philopod at checkout for 15% off of your order. Like Barack Obama. <laughs> Or, you know, people make fun of his, all of that. But um, so this is when cloning starts. This is when we see a shift in how we interact in each other, interact with each other. Once this original godhood of procreation was diverted into something sinister, Whereas arconic forces could now could now inhabit the the, the human uh, meat suit. Hmm. This is so interesting. Like with all these things you're saying, like the idea of making a, a god of a human. And I've talked to some individuals, actually a, a Freemason friend of mine, I believe, who is kind of telling me about some of these sort of things with uh, like the some of the older texts. Uh, neoplatonic i believe describing uh, like maybe ushering in souls at particular timing and whatnot and i i also interviewed this woman a little bit ago where we were going into the history and theory or theory of divine conception and conceiving without male sperm and maybe that's kind of related to what you were saying earlier about the women um mm -hmm. and yeah it's fascinating and i wonder what's your opinion on like Jesus and, and all that? Do you, do you find that as a, as a story or is there some truth in that in terms of like that conception without uh, a male uh, counterpart or what do you think of all that? What do you make of that situation? Well, what we're looking, what we're with Jesus, what we're looking at is a mythopolysis of a true metaphysical um enactment of energies so there's several stories before it's called the christ it's called the christos jesus is separate jesus comes along it's, i would get into that i wouldn't wanted to get it get too deep in that but the christos and you had the cress is what christ comes from that's the original word the cress Jesus is a combination of mythological stories composed into a story of a man that literally did get prosecuted or persecuted, I'm seeing prosecuted, persecuted by the Roman government. Um, his name wasn't Jesus, his name was Yeshua, was a historical figure. That is very, very true. But what we're witnessing is a cryptocratic government. That means a secret society within a secret society within a secret society <laughs> that has come in, bought the Gutenberg press, had arrangements for the Catholic Church to deliver this story in a particular way, where it's true, it's truthful, but there's some things they're taking from mythology and physics to what happens with our souls. And they, they're they contriving a story that is true, but necessarily not true. And this is called the laws of inversion that we did a video on. Everything in masonry is about inversion, in, inside, outside, outside, inside. So if that's what they're doing, they're flipping it. And you'll get some people get mad and they say, no, nah, this is 100% historically true. Absolutely no proof to prove it absolutely no proof 
But when you get into metaphysics, you have no proof either. But we all can agree that there are something unseen by the human eye acting upon us every day in the decisions decisions in our lives. That's why religion had to begin because it's about forces of good and evil. And that's still physics, what we're talking about. So Jesus, to me, the Gnostics said that Jesus was the soul. Simply put, Jesus is the soul. So each and every one of us is Jesus Christ. If you, if ha, at any moment we can do the same acts or do the same moral decision making that Jesus did, and from what Christians believe that that somehow absolves your karmic debt by doing so, it gets you a place in heaven by acting like Jesus. So there's some metaphysical things to it. I won't go too deep into it, but. I think that that should answer the question. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So I'm curious, what are some examples of things like Masonic inversions that uh, you can speak to? I've come to make friends personally with a number of Masons who I actually really admire. And so I, maybe this would be cool to bring up and draw attention to if you want to speak to any Freemasons out there. And um, yeah, maybe it'd just be interesting to get into things like that and or speak to any of that? Well, I would say to those Freemasons, um, <laughs> there's classes, all masonry are, are based, is based on ancient knowledge. And there's classes to this thing where some Freemasons never got access to certain things. Like for instance, some Freemasons know about the Memphis Wright Lodge. Okay. Did you know that the Freemasons held, they came together like, it's like the, the, the Masonic College of Decision-Making or something. It's like all the Masons, the Masonic Lodges come together to make a decision. I can't remember the exact name. And they banned this Memphis Wright Lodge from, I don't know, being a lodge or they banned it because somebody in the lodge, they were doing something crazy, but it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, too off. I won't get into all of that, but the main thing that they didn't want happen is that the Memphis Wright Lodge was the only Masonic lodge on the planet that practiced strictly the first Freemasonhood from Kemet or Egypt when the dynasties were shifting. They had 96 degrees. It's funny because Queen Elizabeth died at 96 years old and Freemason in Gematria equals 96. The reason why they had 96 degrees, whoever became the 96th degree in the, in the Memphis Wright Lodge, they became the sole rule maker. They, they became somewhat of the king of all Mason of um, Memphis Wright Lodges on the planet. So it was only one person who reached that degree. And there's only one person that can be the 96 degree. You can't have multiple 96 degree. And he's like a king. And the, the Masons are like, nah, they want more of like a democracy with this thing. <laughs> They didn't want no type type thing like that. So they completely banned it. So what the, I went, in, went into that to say, there's certain things that some Freemasons would never, ever know about. And not to say that I know because I'm not a Freemason, but I don't have to be a Freemason to understand that occult information isn't just for Freemasons. Occult information is for the initiate, not the neophyte, which they understand. So me coming from a family of Masons, long, long lineage of Masons uh, uh, on my uh, mother's side of my family and the conversations we would have, there is a Jesuit brass 
of controlled Freemasons that connects to Hollywood, connects to the media, it connects to political figures, in anything you may see with your eyes on that TV screen, is this order. Now, they're not formally initiated. I'm saying that the Freemasons that may watch this, they're not initiated like you in knowing, you know, all of you guys know all three degrees. So you got to know that. They may not even know the first two degrees. It's not about that. And you may say, well, they're not Freemasons. Well, let's just say when you study Gematria, the Jesuits have made them a special order class of Freemasons, but really they're more like they're slaves and they know secrets about certain things. And they know that certain things that come out in the media are complete lies that us people that are in the public, we believe to be very true. And it's only a select group of them that knows that's a complete lie. That did not happen at all. That person did not die in a, in a car crash. And we will tell you, we'll look at the news and, said, and say, she died in a car crash. And they will tell you, no, she didn't. Actually, they did an ancient ritual on, on that person and cut their bodies up. And I know they did. <laughs> they just told you they died in a car crash in the corner is also a part of that secret special order. And they will just confirm and say, yeah, she died in a car crash. And they could just put any type of body in there and say she died in a car crash. And that's the story. Alrighty then. Well, very interesting. And I think a very fair perspective, all plausible. Would you, would you relate it to something like, say, if we look at Christianity or uh, maybe uh maybe catholics or something like that you know, there's a lot of catholics that, that are a part of that catholic body and there's a lot of bad there's a lot of uh horrible things that happen within catholicism but does that necessarily represent the true intention or meaning behind catholicism do you feel like that's the same thing with freemasonry or do you find it different do you find that um the structure itself by its very nature is is a a negative thing or maybe expand a little bit more on that the movie that could answer that question is sometimes these movies these jesuits man wow um very very powerful class of people they are the assassinations of the the, yeah, the assassins of the illuminati or the jesuits um they have a movie with Russell Crowe that just came out called The Pope's Exorcist. Most interesting movie. And I don't think something, well, first of all, it's based on a true story. It's based on a guy named Father Amorth, Gabriel Amorth, that literally did over 1,500 exorcisms for the pope in his time on earth and he writes these journals of different ways to deal with these entities and in the movie they drop a jewel they're battling one of the goetia the goetic demons or of the goetia of solomon's order uh his name is osmodius and in, in, in demonology, Osmodius would be the king of hell. Osmodius is a demon in this text that has the ability, one, to inhabit a holy clergyman's body. Demons prototypically can do that. But he also, he, he also he has a rare ability to inhabit multiple bodies at once. Okay, they named that in the movie. All Everything I'm saying, they say it in the movie. So they're trying to possess Russell Crowe in the movie. And make a long story short, the, the Pope in the movie discovers that's 
that is Osmodius that they've been battling. And he faints because he's so scared. Because the reason why he's scared, he realizes that Osmodius has been possessing all the clergymen in the Catholic Church since almost 300 years after its inception. So that means that every denomination that comes out of Catholicism was set up by a demon in hell. <laughs> I'm not trying to laugh, but this is some crazy stuff because my witness of what I experienced in Christianity, it makes a lot of sense. It's so, so mm, this, yeah. oh, man, this is all just so interesting. Because I talked to a lot of different people and getting a lot of different perspectives. And I think I'd actually recently listened to an interview with a friend of mine that I've interviewed as well. His name's Douglas Gabriel. And he was actually a legit exorcist himself, former Jesuit. No longer he speaks out against the Jesuit order. And I'm sure he does. <laughs> and he, uh, I think he was saying some things about that movie as well, kind of talking a little bit about the, the truths in it and the falsities in it that are kind of Hollywood input and whatnot, but. Oh man, you have that on your, is that on your page? That I've got a couple interviews on my page with him individually, but he has his own channel. Uh, just type in Douglas Gabriel on YouTube. He's a very fascinating guy, but he has Thanks, an man. interview with a guy named, I think it's Michael Kibben where they're going into like some of the different demonology and talking about that movie and his perspective and, his thoughts around that since he actually was involved with some of these individuals and he's aware of a lot of some of the behind the scenes uh stuff with some of this information that it's all based off of from a first-hand experience so i think it's just so interesting hearing everybody's different perspectives as somebody you know on the outside i'm just like man i don't know what to make of it and i think is it is Asmodeus? I always thought that that was the demon of lust. Was is that not the case? Is it a different man? Honestly, bro, probably so. He probably has some some power over lust, but I know he's not the main one over lust. No, yeah, they call him the king of hell. He's he's a general, mm. but these things, if you look into the Lamogaton of uh, the Sumerian star constellations, all of the Goetic sigils in Solomon's lesser key of magic book are literally drawings of lines of constellations in the sky, bro. We're talking about conscious threads of entities that's coming from the stars. Man, yeah, I remember you mentioning that, and that was something I wanted to get into with you because I was like, what? That is fascinating. I think you were describing the sigils of these or something like that were correspondent to these constellational yeah. entities or something like that? Or Yeah, I could. You, do you want me to share and show yeah, you it? Yeah, definitely. Okay, let me share it for you. Hold on one sec. Okay, you have to enable screen sharing for it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the... Um... You guys, if you want to look at it, it's in the book called the Lamogaton. Very rare book. And as the the information of how the Sumerian, the Sumerians were looking at this constellation called Molapin, and they figured out that that whole Anunnaki thing and all of the serious information were computations of how these stars, different computations of stars trigger different um, effects on consciousness on the planet, depending where the ley line is in the azimuthal uh, map, the equidistant map, where it lines up, it pours into a certain region and it can, it can affect a whole community based on how the earth, you know, the earth is tilted 23 degrees and these constellations are pouring like consciousness and entities consciousness down over these ley lines. And the Mo the Lamogaton is, is showing you the basics of that. If Try you know what you're looking at. 
Try to see if you could mm -hmm. share it now. I just try to enable some stuff. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm good now. Hold on. Okay. Can you see? Let me know if you can see this. Yep. Yeah, it's pulling up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here it goes. Oh, what happened? Okay. Let me just exit that. Just make this a little bit smaller. All right. So you guys see this? So it's in chapter three of the Lamogaton. And he shows that these, you see how this is the constellation? Mm -hmm. It's nothing but this, this is the seal of one of the Goetic daemons. So he's he's talking about it right here on this page. So he's saying, so Anu represents the, this, they call it ascendant masters, but the people who have big stock into how consciousness is changing other consciousness on the planet it's an egregore collective of people who's mastered their consciousness collectively we're called the anu the anunnaki <laughs> and it says the anu their consciousness lays between 30 degrees negative 30 degrees from the equator of the 12 classical zodiacal constellations and they talk about how it's dispersed <clears throat> there's four connected to anu and over here, they're showing those connections of the constellations. But it's interesting because what I notice here is that every constellation is the Goetic seal. That's in Solomon's book. So wow. we're witnessing, yeah, it's funny, it's called the God Hunt on this <laughs> page. But this is so interesting to me that that's not explained, that each of these symbols are a polarizing of masculine and feminine energies. Syzygies is what they're called. It's when a star moves three degrees one direction and three degrees another direction. It creates something called a syzygy in consciousness, in Gnosticism, Gnostic physics. And this is affecting all of our, when this constellation is over a certain ley line, Baal is near to affect your consciousness wow okay so is this saying that these constellations are they like entities in and of themselves or is it or is it yeah like what do you how do you well if you look biblically most of the demons are... that sorry go ahead uh when, uh biblically when when jesus and other um, clergymen would speak to demons and exorcists. Um, the demon would tell them, we are many. They would usually say, we're legions. We're not one. <laughs> they're, never, they're never one. So we think of it as one entity. But no, it's a collective group. Just like humanity itself, we are a collective group. Our decision-making isn't based off one person that ever lived It's the whole society is built by multiple minds so we are an entity in itself in consciousness and they are as well cosmic influences as entities wow. so yes constellations so in, are entities yeah wow this is so interesting and so do you view these as all of these various constellations and seals and entities are uh, i guess kind of in your in your assessment there is no negative and positive it's just like they are what they are and they just affect us on this earth realm just by virtue of uh their higher order being or are these competing forces with angelic forces or how do you kind of view all that well, I look at them, I look at them all as tools. So just like you have a knife to cut your carrots, to cut your, your fruit and your vegetables, a knife is very useful for that, right? 
It's very useful to cut that. But it, it also, you can take a knife and stab somebody. You see? So I think these entities are susceptible to our control. But if you get the book, it's not coming to my mind right now, but it's an important book. Because in the book it says, since you have neglected the things about yourself that have moved into your subconscious, deep into your subconscious, he's describing the Goetia. I can't remember the guy's name. Very important, known author. But he's describing the Goetia as the neglected parts of our consciousness. And since we neglected them, he says in this verse in his in his or his, a chapter in his book, he says they become like abandoned dogs off a leash. Mm. And formerly they were on a leash by us. So when we go outside, it's like you saying your pet, come come here, little poo poo, come here, poo poo, and it's growling like at you, and you like come on, like come here, but you neglected it and it. You really don't know poo poo ain't the same thing no more because you neglected it. So when we neglect parts of ourselves, like when we bury trauma deep in ourselves, they become a part of these energies. And they're called demons to the Christians. Yeah. And okay. So formally, like you, when you're saying, uh having them on a leash and and whatnot would this kind of get into something along the lines of like solomon or solomonic magic i think i'd come across something where solomon was able or potentially utilized some of these forces and employed them in terms of building a temple and i don't know if that's like a a story or if that's a reality or what do you make of that so this is a metaphor metaphor okay the the the, the solomon's temple is is exoteric in its esoteric solomon's temple is the physical body but it's also the chakra bodies as well that is solomon's temple because the word saul means sun and amen means hidden the hidden sun the hidden sun temple is the chakras as we explained earlier with the sush the sushamna which is right along where the chakras would be in your body up to here. That is Solomon's temple that the sun or the hidden God, Amun-Ra, the quantum dot, the Bindu seed, rises and declines itself every single day, just like the sun and the constellations you see above, which are holographic to what's going on inside of you. We're looking at the holographic universe from the and, outside when we see the celestial bodies but yeah so what about like solomon's seals like what the lesser and greater keys of solomon thing are the are those similar similar to what uh like the the keys of solomon don't they have like similar sigil structures that we're kind of looking at with oh yeah this? i'm and pretty you, sure you could find it yeah i wonder if those would mm -hmm. be a similar sort of correlative thing I don't know. I'm not too, <laughs> I'm not too advanced or anything in that area, but it just popped into my head. Oh, well, I did a video on my YouTube called Esoteric Engineering. And I saw, I showed how electrical engineer blueprints look exactly like Solomon's greater sales and lesser sales. Mm -hmm. So how we do electrical input today whether it's in computer science, whether it's in how we build the blueprint and layout of things of um, electrical instruments or how we input electricity in homes and buildings, you can look at the Goetia and see the same symbol for the same electrical engineered symbols that they use. And I showed a... a I showed the comparison and I showed a video of it on that YouTube video. If you guys want to look at that. That's fascinating. 
Um, and do you feel like these these lay? I think there's you're corresponding these to ley lines. Is that similar to? Would these have an energetic ley line correspondence to like particular uh, earth ley line, like the earth grid and the earth grid ley lines that maybe some people are familiar familiar with as well? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I did a video on that last night. Actually, they oh, have. Nice. Um, I want to watch that one. <laughs> yeah, it's on my Patreon, but it was like um, these cities. There's a lot of cities, and I was I was shown the picture from somebody because a lot of people they'll watch my video and then they'll send me an email and say, "Hey, you probably didn't really know this subject matter that good, but you were on to something because." They they either worked in some type of field of of, of science or some type of uh, masonry field of building things, and they'll send me and I and the guy sent me these cities of how they built. In the inside of out of the cities is built exactly how ley lines fit into a grid system on different continents for certain purposey purposes of energy uses. So there would be a area in America that's used specifically for a purpose, energetically, and they lay out the cities to be conducive to how that ley line looks on the grid. And then you can see the, also the comparison when you look into the symbology of either sigils, seals, electric engineering you can see the same layout he showed the lines through the the the, the cities and the count the counties above it looks exactly similar if you were to draw a pencil and start to color in areas it's all magic man wow. our whole entire layout of how we're here is based on somebody doing a magical system and we're just living on top of their magic kingdom that they draw it out. Okay, something else that you talked about I found very interesting was the mind virus of the Watika, I think, or mm. there's another theosophical Ooh. word related to that, some kind of like mimicking entity that hacks the astral plane's lattices. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Yes, the entity is called the Antimamos. And the theosophists knew about it. The Gnostics knew about it because they said whoever got possessed by it, they were called Hylix. And it's similar to that group of people that I told you about earlier in this discourse of when the gods no longer were pulled, pulled down through metasects, through uh, visualizing the chakras, then entities started, come, started to come to this world through the lower three chakras. And they were called Hylix, meaning people who are born only into a materialist mindset. This is the archons hijacking the genetic pool data of the ancients. So they started to acquire meat, meat suits. And these people, you know them in your lives today you ever try to bring up something spiritual like this and fascinating details that might intrigue you, they will call you stupid and crazy. And they will say, this life is all about money and how many people you can deceive to get it and only love those who's close to you. Everything else is a game to them. This is a particular entity that the indigenous Amer Americans name specifically the Watiko virus. And they say that this virus has spread across humanity and it's making a, an, a other pool clan data of genetics that's been polluting our bloodlines for centuries now. And the purpose of what they're trying to do, you can get Pierre Savick's book. Um, what is the name of his book? 
Pierre Sabak's book, Murder, Murder Your Reality. Murder, Murder Your Reality. And in the book, he says that the people who are possessed by this Watiko, he calls them the people of the Seraphim or the Seraphine bloodline. And he says that there they go. They're messing with the stream right now. That's them. <laughs> Hold on. Can you still see me? Yeah, I see you. Okay. It's cool, man. They're just in there just playing around. <laughs> he says that their whole purpose is to ride the DNA of the Kiribum. It's interesting because in the angelic hierarchy, the Kiribum is what Lucifer was, actually. It's this four-headed angel with these, they had a, a bunch of wings and they have these eyes and stuff, but that's how they draw them. But they have the ability to get to one side of the universe to another side of the universe instantly. And they're drawing comparisons because these entities are the androgynes. They were the first born out of Sophia's Aeon versus Yaudabaeus, Yaudabaeus Aeon, the Archons. So these beings, these androgynes or Kiribums inhabited the hominids of the human race that was produced from that virgin class of Typhonian women in the Parthenogenesis. And the whole purpose of the Seraphine class is to ride the genetics to the uh, of the Kiribum into future timelines because they don't have the ability to jump and have the quantum leap into the next timeline, which isn't human. We weren't humans to begin with. We were not in existence as humans. Damn, shit's wild. Okay, so with this Kiribum class, is this related to like what you would refer to as the Illuminati, I think people have different uh, interpretations or perspectives on the Illuminati and maybe this class of individuals with this higher level education. Uh, like, do you feel like there's a mix within this class of both malevolence as well as benevolence or what's your take on all that? I think the Illuminati classes do not desire to make a quantum leap. I think I think they're very much aware of it. And I think they just want to rule over your asses forever here where they already dominate dominate this reality. Why make a quantum leap into another reality and have to start all over of how we're going to mind control that reality? They already have a grasp of this one. So their job is to distract you. So whoever desires to make the quantum leap has already the genetics of even having the thought to make the quantum leap. Therefore, they are the curable class hmm. or the priestly class. We can take these terms and be interchangeable because we know curables don't really exist. Is describing a consciousness. That's all it is. That's what the code is. It's not everything is set in stone. What people have done, they have take a a religious background to it and installed it into these things so now i only can study reptilians and curabums or nephilim or watchers and really these things are interchangeable very quickly when you start to move the pieces around and you know the history the culture the physics the mathematics when you start to understand all of it then you don't get set on one term and you don't die on, on the hill on that sword, yeah. so to speak. So with like the historical stuff, like with Adam Weiss of uh, Bavarian Illuminati, for example, do you feel like that's related to the Illuminati that you're speaking about? Or is it like a totally different thing? Adam Uh Yeah. yeah. Is that how to pronounce his name? Or uh, or something? I don't know. I say bi like Bicep, but. I, something like I, that. I, yeah. That sounds right enough. He's a Jesuit. Um, you said, are they the same Illuminati that I'm speaking like, of? Him, yeah, his that, class? 
The Bavarians? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Same one. Okay. And then, so when you're speaking about uh, Sophia's Aeon, like Sophia, is Sophia related to wisdom in your understanding, or is that a. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And Sophia, that... if you study Aeonology, um, the Aeons are the superconscious and the conscious mind of the Pleroma. And the Archons or the demons, daemons, daemons, or um, Watiko, Seraphims, <laughs> are the subconscious, unconscious mind of the Pleroma. So she represents the superconscious construct. Her mother is Barbello, where you get the word Babel from Babylon. All of these terms come from Barbello, who is the mother of Sophia. And even Barbello has a parent named Bythos, which is the highest of the triacontide of the hypostasis of the archons. Um, a androgyne aeon that birth aeons all the aeons below and we're talking about um clads of consciousness of the monad of god's mind that is arranged in certain lattices in geometrical order to distribute how the lower world becomes a mirror world to these aeons. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so bouncing back to the Anu or the Anuna or the Anunnaki, perhaps. Um, I know that you're in the, the perspective of obviously it's not related to any thing along the lines of like reptilians and any of that but what do you view like because i think in some of the anunnaki mythology there's like the anunnaki and then there's the ajiji um Mm -hmm. what do you make of the relationship between uh, is the the anunnaki a, uh, a reality in your understanding in terms of like beings of do you do you view it as there were some kind of beings that had manipulated uh, our DNA and uh, to be maybe making us like a working class because that's like one of the uh, stories or the understandings that people will talk about. Do you view it like that or do you view it totally different? Or Well, see, that's the thing about it. I just gave you a layout that there was a being, there was beings that, I did say that it was a pollution of the genetic clan data. And remember I said that because we started to have sex recreationally, we stopped visualizing the chakras. So if the Anunnaki, it seems like the Anunnaki has to be negative, right? They have to be something negative if you want to ask the alien cults. So if they are... mm -hmm. But what about the story of like Enlil and Enki and wasn't one of them more of a friend to humanity or, or like a lower level? Just talking about Lucifer and God or Yahweh. Okay. Lucifer and Yahweh. You want to go to the Greek mythology, Zeus and Prometheus. And so Yahweh, is God. like do you view mm-hmm. Yahweh as a benevolent entity? No. Oh, no. no. <laughs> now let's just say this esoterically you can become Yahweh and that will be benevolent if you really walked into that term for what it is but the <laughs> Yahweh God exoterically that we see the God like Zeus who throw who strikes you with lightning if you do bad <laughs> Zeus then what we're looking at is the tyrannical God of the Demiurge that comes out of the Gnostic text called Yaudabaoth. 
or his his name is Rexus Mundi, or his name is um uh he has several names uh Sackless, also call him Sackless, the blind god. His name is Azathoth in the Necronomicon. Mm. Azathoth is the same god of the Bible. Whereas if you do something wrong, but it also says he's jealous of some other god. And it's funny, if you go to a uh, verse in the Bible, um, what's that verse? Slipping off my, my head, which you can type it in. It's, it says that, this is uh, Yahweh talking. He said, I am not the God of the living. No, he said, I am not the God of the dead. You are sadly mistaken. I am the God of the living. And in terms of like Prometheus or Lucifer, like with Lucifer, I think in the biblical stuff, maybe there's like one mention of Lucifer and some people will argue it's just referring to the morning star. Is there any other historical references in your opinion? Or what do you draw from in terms of that that entity that you correlate with Lucifer? Or do you just use it as a terminology to kind of describe what you're speaking about? Hey, here's Scott. Oh, hey, you went out for a second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you miss my last part? Uh, yeah, the last part I missed. Uh, okay, I just, just repeat it last. I was, I, yeah, I was wondering in terms of uh, like the Prometheus or Lucifer thing, uh, like biblically, I think Lucifer is only mentioned once, and some people will will just say that that's referring to the morning star. So I wonder if you've come across any other historical references in regard to Lucifer, or do you just use it as uh, a a related terminology to kind of describe what you're talking about, or what about like that whole thing? Yeah, Lucifer is a lot of things. There's a whole lot of things. That's a a quasi explanative of metaphysics when you're speaking Lucifer. But this is go off my last point. I'm gonna cross reference that when I say that he's he says he's not the god of the dead in a Bible verse. Um then how, if you're not the God of the dead, when I die, I don't see you. <laughs> People just have to think for a second. So he's clarifying, I'm not the God of the dead. I am the God of the living. I mean, he's the God, he's the God of the physical realm, the 3D reality. He is our ego. And the God of the dead is Osiris. Of Egypt, his name is Asar, because Asar is the dead god, and Asar is just our subconscious. Hmm. That's all it is. Lucifer, if you want to just sum up, Lucifer is the pineal gland, just as Prometheus. What did Prometheus do? Prometheus was a titan. See, if you want to understand, metaphysical history you have to know the story of the titans and the gods because it's the same story told over and over and over and what they're describing is physics chronos didn't really eat children you got these illuminati people eating children because they took it literal when they're describing him eating children if i had a rim up here and there's a rim down here and this rim got so old that it started to mitigate energy down to this realm. This realm would devour that energy before it gets to this realm so it can stay up here. So it didn't want this realm to fall into this realm. That's what they were describing. They were describing physics. Mm. They weren't describing something literal. <laughs> you see? Yeah. And he's time. So even they even said Kronos is the father of time. So if I took time and I described that that should also get the wheels in the head turning but Prometheus is Lucifer Prometheus was a titan that tried to convince Kronos and the boys 
I know y'all want to battle the Olymp Olympus gods, but y'all are going to lose if y'all don't listen to me. You can't kill these dudes with brute force. By the way, Prometheus means foresight. Every Titan had a special ability. His ability was he was able to see the future. Okay. What happens is Kronos and them said, screw that. We're about to attack these people with all we got. So Prometheus joins up with the gods because he could see what, what, what was going to happen. He saw everything. So what happens is Zeus allows him to join with the gods because he has this ability to see the future. They defeat the Titans. But this is the story they don't tell you. When the Titans were defeated, Zeus takes his lightning bolt and it says in the mythology, he strikes the Titans with the lightning bolt because he's angry. And he turns all of the Titans into something called Titanic Ash. Then he takes this Titanic Ash and he makes humans out of it. Whoa, mm. that would mean that the human race are the Titans. Once again, the fallen angel story. Now, what happens is Zeus, while humans started to come up in the world, hominids, straight spines, homo sapien, sapien, all of this stuff. It, said, it's, it is said at the beginning of our history, we had two voices or, or, or two separate voices, ourselves and another voice that will speak to us. What was it called? It's in Westworld. You got to see Westworld. Uh, oh, man, that's yeah, it's a good that's a good one. By by cameralism. That's what it's called. So to the two mind. And what happened is what happened was over periods of time, the voice lesson into the church just told you when the catholic church came around he said that's demons talking to you mm -hmm. <laughs> but way back then the ancient said this other voice was connected to this god source that used to tell you things he used to talk to you in your head look up the bicameral mind wow zeus wanted to silence this thing so what was the bicameral mind prometheus of course is a titan as i told you he knew that the Titans were going to be turned into humans because he could see the future. So what he did was stay behind so he could betray Zeus. What was Prometheus crying? He gave fire of the gods to the humans. He gave us consciousness. He gave us the bicameral mind to lead us back up out of here, out of Zeus's trap, which is the underworld, Tartarus. So Zeus gets mad. He takes Prometheus and he locks him up in the underworld and he has some type of mechanical vulture picking out his liver forever, which is the same story of G Jesus being poked in the side with the spear of destiny. He gets poked in the same area as Prometheus. Look it up. <laughs> and what happens is Zeus is looking for something in Prometheus' body called the black. Now, what is, what is said by these Greek writers who's drawing up, which they got, got it all from the Etruscans, that's your pre-Greeks in the Colchians, is said that this black is the kidney of Prometheus and whoever obtained it will have the ability to look directly into the future. Not only that, to who or what would kill Zeus. That's why our kidneys are so important to the body. Of course, it cleans the blood and cleans things. But Zeus wants prometheus kidneys but he's unable to get it 
because he wants to see which human, what which one of his sons is going to overthrow him. Because you know you have he Zeus has sex with a bunch of humans. He disguises himself as a human and but Pr Prometheus tells him one of your sons is going to overthrow you. He says, which one? He said, I'm not going to tell you. Hmm. Which means that we are here to overthrow this God that rules the magnetosphere and keeps us trapped below the dome. Sorry, that was a long rant. No, oh, thank you for that. Man, this is an wild and craziest conversation i've probably had but in a good way <laughs> um yeah i don't know that kind of sums up all the the stuff i wanted to get into with you is there any Great. anything else any additional thoughts that you think are important or interesting that you want to throw out there before we kind of wrap it up yeah i'm gonna keep it brief uh if this stuff st sounds crazy it could be explained i can give you scholarship i can give you direct i like to give you the, the, the direct page that's what people say yeah, i'm gonna t t take you straight to the page so you can see this that we are not in the real world we are in a holographic reality the klepoff or the kabbalah is the real world <laughs> people keep saying oh, it was the demon world well you gotta give me your interpretation of demons because this stuff is physics this has nothing to do with moralism Religion just taught us how to be a good human, and that's good. That's good for humanity. But if you want to know the mysteries of the soul, you got to get deep into this type of physics. And hopefully on my next podcast with you, you can, you can allow me to do a lecture, and I can take you through some stuff, and you guys can um, get some information. But I appreciate you for having me today, man. It was real good. Absolutely. It was real good stuff. Man. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Yeah, we'll definitely do another one. I'd love to. Um, where would you Excellent. like to direct anybody, any of your links, any of your sites, or any anything that you want people to check out? Yeah, sure. Um, you guys can find me at Ani Osaru on YouTube. You can find me at the Spiritual Shade Room and put the number one at the end on Instagram. Or come join our Patreon, which is exclusive information. Patreon.com slash the underscore spiritual shade room. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much again. And yeah, until next time, brother. Till next time, man. Thanks for having me.